Um, so tonight we're going to dive into our story, The Way Sand Wants for Water, which takes place at Gateway Park on the Cooper River Trail in Pensacola, New Jersey. And tonight I am joined uh, by the writer of this story, Afak. Hi, Afak. <laughs> and Justin Dennis from the New Jersey Conservation Foundation. And um, I'm going to start off just by reading your guys' bios because you're both amazing. Um, and then we'll jump in. So Afak is a Philly-based daughter with grandmother tendencies assembled in Yemen from Sudanese parts. Afak considers themselves a global citizen of their own country. This international award-winning poet, museum exhibiting photographer, activist, and educator seeks to love the world until it loves them back. They have collaborated with Netflix, Pen America, Beautycon Media, Poetry Out Loud, the Barnes Foundation, and several universities, including NYU, Columbia, and UPenn. Continuously targeted and previously arrested for their activism, Afak uses their art, experiences, and the violence they have witnessed to combat injustice while spreading messages of empathy and change. Hi, Afak. <laughs> And Justin Dennis uh, joined the New Jersey Conservation Foundation in September of 2016 as their urban parks manager. In this role, he oversees the development, maintenance, and programming of several NJCF properties in the Camden region. Justin has several years of experience in invasive species management, environmental remediation, and community conservation, holds multiple leadership positions within various local and regional initiatives, and a, has a BA in environmental studies and sustainability from Jew University. In his free time, Justin enjoys spending time outdoors, seeing live music, and relaxing with his two cats, Squish and Nudge. <laughs> Hi, Justin. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> I'm so excited for you guys uh, to be on the call. Um, we were having some fun before you guys in the audience came in. Um, I, I'm, uh, this is the first time that Justin and Abak are in a, a Zoom space together or a uh, virtual or literal space. Um, so I'm really excited um, to uh, have you guys um, illuminate like the two sides of this piece uh, in the same space. So I'm going to start off uh, with a question for you, Afak. And I'm wondering if you can just talk a little bit about what your creative life before Trail Off looked like. I know I mentioned some of like the, the, the big milestones, but I'm, I'm just interested for you to talk about your body of work from your own perspective and maybe give some insight into like what kind of burning questions your uh, artistic life has explored in the past. Thank you. That's a wonderful question. Um, I'd say that my artistic life before Trail Off was chaotic and reflective of my relationship with language. I speak, I'll just say I speak a lot <laughs> of languages. Um, and I see art as a way, like a lens to view the world and language as a way to explain it. And oftentimes those two things overlap. So for me, um, a literal lens is photography. <laughs> I'm a photographer. Um, but I also see photography as a language in the sense that it's a way for the world to be translated from one lens to another. Um, so yeah, before Trail Off, I was interested in capturing the world to understand it, documenting my life for the world to understand me, and just having a jolly old time. Um, <laughs> but so I would say that art before Trail Off was challenging, but not challenging enough. And that's why I'm here. <laughs> awesome, thank you. <laughs> um, and Justin, I'll, I'll ask um, kind of a similar question. Like, can you just talk a little bit about what your work with New Jersey Conservation Foundation looks like? How did you get involved in the work that they do? And, and maybe what are some of the kinds of things that you've been a part of uh, in the past? Awesome, thanks. Um, I guess, you know, it probably makes sense to start at the beginning. Uh, my entry into this field, I guess, is kind of peculiar. Um, and that's, that's part of why I love this piece so much. Uh, I, I started out pre-med. Um, I feel like a lot of people get into pre-med because it's one of those things that seems lucrative. But I, I went uh, osteopathic route because um, I really wanted to help people help themselves. And um, shocker, I was bad at organic chemistry. Um, just like everyone is, right? Uh, 
but uh, I actually got arrested in college um, on several felony drug charges and had a bunch of community service and stuff that I needed to do, which led me to invasive species management. And um, through that, I met my supervisor or my advisor, excuse me, uh, my mentor in college and um, declared the major and interned at NJCF. And uh, long and short of it, I, I applied for a position and I uh, was selected in 2016 to, to work here. So um, yeah, my, my uh, connection to nature is, is very much through the lens, um, like this, this piece says of wounds and scars and healing. Um, and it just so, so deeply touched me in that way. Um, just a little bit on NJCF, we're a, a 501c3 um, designated uh, land trust in the state of New Jersey. We do statewide work. Uh, we've been in the city of Camden since 1986. We were invited in by the city government at the time uh, to help plan and, and develop a greenway along the Cooper River Trail. So actually a lot of our work, you know, 35 years down the road um, is much of the same work, uh, but the action points of, of the planning that was done over the last 30 years or so. So I'm in a fortunate position to be able to see this stuff actualize in real time um, on, on the backs of many other people who've done this great work. Uh, before me, um, we we uh, are one of the key partners working to increase access to the Cooper River right now. So that is through the the framework of providing various types of infrastructure and amenity installations. Um, I guess uh, what I my most enjoy about my position is I get to work with other individuals who have criminal histories, formerly incar incarcerated individuals and get to help them uh, seek new opportunities through green jobs training and green jobs realignment. So um, that's something that obviously was, you know, deeply uh, influential in my own life and I want to be able to do what I can to help others. So while we do a lot of great stuff, um, that's, that's probably the thing that I enjoy most and it's just because opportunity speaks for itself. And I think that if you're working in places like Camden, um, right, you need to look at things in terms of opportunity and not in terms of, of history and um, where people have been. So um, I'll just say one other thing. You mentioned um, some leadership positions in my bio. I'm a steering committee member for the Alliance for Watershed Education. Um, that's a William Penn funded initiative, a regional initiative seeking to build constituencies surrounding watershed issues and watershed education. Um, we're car and I oversee the River Days program series. That's a, a month long series of events from September 15th to October 15th. We're currently figuring out our virtual in-person stuff right now too. Um, but it engages over 15,000 residents annually in, in these types of programs that seek to build community around the assets that are in their neighborhoods. Um, yeah, so I think I'll just leave it at that for now. That's awesome. So something, I, I think I mentioned this to you, Afak, like actually one of the, so William Penn Foundation was also one of the funders of the Trail Off Project and actually through their watershed initiative. Um, this was kind of like, I, I think similar to a Fox story and some of the things you're talking about, like there's like a lot of threads woven up in the project. And one of the one of the pitches was like that that this project would increase um, awareness on the watershed. And actually, um, one of the questions early on was like, can we tell the artists they have to write about water? And I was like, no, we cannot tell an artist they have to write about water. Um, but I was like, but I but 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 trust me. If you lead the artist to the water, that's the, the thing that they're going to be inspired by. And, and I think actually, I mean, it's in the title. So I think we did a pretty good job hitting, uh, hitting that um, goal for the project. Um, so Avak, I would love for you to talk a little bit about um, actually what drew you to be a part of Trail Off. Um, clearly, it wasn't writing about water because I didn't mention that when you first met. Um, but I, I, I would love for you to talk a little bit about like how you heard about it, like why you thought this might be interesting, like what is it about writing a story for a trail that seemed like it might be a creative challenge that you were excited by? Yeah. That's a great question, too. Well, I was excited about Trail Off, and I also wrote my story based on one fact, which is that I have no business being in the woods or the wilderness or anything like that. But I bought a pair of sneakers for trail off. I don't know how to tie my shoelaces. Just everyone ignore that part. But it was just, it was for me an interesting challenge. Um, something that I looked at and was like, I don't know how I got here. 
how I'm gonna get to the other side, but what a good time. Um, <laughs> um, as I say, my life before trail off um, artistically was photography and poetry, but my like work life before trail off was also artistically. So that means all I really did was poetry, photography, and teaching. Um, an important note about me is I am immunocompromised. I have been dealing with a lot of um, serious illness um, that I was in denial about up until trail off. So I was really slowing down because I had to, not because I wanted to. Um, I was, I had a fellowship called the Women's Mobile Museum. I was um, doing, doing the most, we'll say. <laughs> Um, and then I found myself naturally doing less um, when an org I collaborate with often called Alustan, um, somebody that I wrote with once and we became fast friends, told me about Trela and I had to ask myself a question, which was, am I really slowing down or could we have like one more wild ride? And I told myself even then, before I understood like the gravity of the illness, that this would be my last wild ride for a while. Um, and it was wild. Me and Adrian <laughs> like met for the first time. We talked at a coffee shop and then she was explaining something that made absolutely um, some kind of sense, but it was like, <laughs> it was when, I don't know, when the first time uh, an equation makes sense to you as a child. It was like the first time you look at the sky and understand why it's blue. Um, that was that for me artistically. I was just like, GPS, geography, writing, us, nature? Okay, you know what? We can make it work. And we did. <laughs> Hope that answered the question. <laughs> totally. <laughs> um, yeah, it's um, for folks who, so actually, Afak knows this, but um, Afak was the very first artist that I talked to about the project. Every single person who eventually became part of the project, like all the artists who applied, I met in person for a conversation um, before any of the process started. And if I was the very first one, I thought, oh no, if they're all this good, I'm gonna be in real trouble trying to pick people. <laughs> Cause I, I don't even remember how long it was scheduled for, but we went like way, way long and like somebody else was waiting. And I was like, I'm sorry, like I have to cut the talk cause there's another person over there. But like, this was great. And I remember you were just like, can we just be friends now? <laughs> So it was definitely a very auspicious start to the project together. Um, so I'm wondering, um, uh, Katie, if you'll play, I would just love to, for audiences to get a little sneak peek of um, what the story sounds like. So if you can start that first clip that starts at 2.20. Yep, just a moment, everybody. Does a river know when it stops flowing? Does a person know when they've become a shadow to themselves? Does a tree know when it has fallen? Do you know why you're here? Every scar eventually fades. It may feel like life does too. Shedding is not loss. It's the release of what is no longer needed. This is to say, you don't want to die. You just don't want to feel this way. Look to the trees and know the difference. Hey, Katie, you can take that there. Um, I like this, I like this so much. <laughs> um, Justin, I wonder if you can um, talk a little bit about the history of the trail. Like, what is the story of the space where, um, where Gateway Park 
is now, like what was there before and, and like what will people s literally see when they come to visit and maybe what's something that they won't see that might be interesting for them to know? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, well, I'll, I'll start with, you know, the Cooper River as the centerpiece, right? You know, um, that served as critical Native American gathering space and, and living space. Um, you know, it, we obviously know how uh, indigenous Americans were removed from their ancestral lands, and that's no different in, in this region of New Jersey. Um, through the colonial era, uh, it was settled by the Cooper family, settled, right? Put that in quotes. And um, their name still brandishes, you know, a lot of things in Camden, right? Cooper Hospital and um, these different institutions in the city that are sort of the economic powerhouses um, and, and uh, a lot of Camden's critical assets were, were generated by the settling of, of this area by that family. Um, with the development of the Ben Franklin Bridge, 1926 to 1928, um, you know, at that point, cars were not uh, an essential component of people's lives. It was really a recreational amenity for wealthy people at that point. So the need for roads wasn't as intense as it is now, um, but by the mid 1950s, um, you know, post-World War II, cars really began to infiltrate America. And with that, Admiral Wilson Boulevard was built. And with cars and roads comes gas stations and food. Um, there's some incredible historic photos that, that can be shared and probably sourced online um, for anyone that's interested. But within the, the period of about 20 years, uh, it went from sort of just a bypass highway to, um, you know, a really burgeoning young suburban infrastructure uh, on this major transportation corridor that ran basically south to Atlantic City. Um, with with uh, white flight and, and post-industrial America and all of the things associated with um, predatory lending and various zoning ordinances, um, it started to, a lot of people started to leave the city and with that um, various types of establishments that uh, you know, they're called CD in many of the documents that we use. I'm not in the market of judging sex work or whatever, but, um, you know, that is what it was attracting. And there was a lot of crime that really caused much of the pass through stigma that Camden is still working against right now. Um, so that from about the 70s to the late 90s was a big issue um, in New Jersey, especially. And if you're from New Jersey or from the area, like everyone has heard of Camden and no one is supposed to go there. And I remember hearing it in high school, you know, my mom grew up in Newark and she had bad stories about Camden. And um, in the late nineties, uh, early 2000s, um, the Republican National Convention was hosted in 2001. And prior to that happening, the property was condemned. All of these businesses were condemned through eminent domain, taken from people, their livelihoods sort of just eviscerated right whether people agree or disagree that's their source of income and how they support their families um, but uh, former governor Christine Todd Whitman didn't want to have people going to the convention seeing what Camden was known for in the 70s 80s and 90s and with that created this scenic byway um, without really doing any of the hard work to make sure that it was a usable space um, so in in 2001, the park was officially open, but none of the contamination that was there from oil tanks or gas stations or even just roadway runoff were cleaned up. No benches, tables, bathrooms, amenities of any kind were installed at the site. And uh, much of what you see today is actually what was originally laid out in that first park uh, iteration. Um, so that's that took until about 2014. Um, where community voices just continued to persevere and push through. Uh, after the eminent domain um, claim, DRPA, uh, who manages you know, all the bridges and roadways in the region took ownership of the property and they, it got to the point where they were unable to not listen to the voices of the people pushing to have the space cleaned. So um, that's when our involvement at NJCF really began. Uh, you know, we saw it as a good opportunity for us to really make a significant impact in the city and um, have been working towards that ever since. And um, it took about five years to get all the contamination cleaned up on the site. Um, both of you know the space really well. You know that there's fences there still blocking off some access points uh, because of potential recontamination, superficial runoff and that kind of stuff. 
but um, in March of 2019, it finally opened after over 19 years of sitting vacant and dormant and unused uh, along a transportation corridor that sees 40,000 cars every day, right? So it's not like this is a place that people don't see and um, don't have access to, but um, really, you know, prior to COVID really getting intense, we had been working hard towards um, just activating that space, right? And providing opportunities for engagement that hadn't been there for the past 20 years. And it's not like there wasn't incentive or pressure to do that. It's just, you know, logistical and legal constraints prevented us from doing it any earlier. And um, that relief of being allowed to have that happen uh, was definitely recognizable in the residents who attended some of those first events. It was so magical. Some things you just like can't even put into words. I feel it. I'm like getting jittery <laughs> thinking about it. Um, but yeah, if you, if you were just driving by, um, you know, even 25 years ago, you would have seen every sort of industry possible. Uh, you would have probably smelled the river. Um, it was, you know, a significant amount of sewage was still, raw sewage was still running into the river at that point. Um, so really this major transformation um, into a space that people can gather in has, has, is very recent in the grand scheme of how we look at land. It's, um, it's like, uh, it's one of those trails that actually like is one of my favorite trails because it's not a trail that I think like necessarily, if people were like, make the list of the top 10 trails that like you have to put in an app about trails. Like it might not be one that people initially go like, oh, it's so bucolic. It's like the picturesque trail, but it's actually one of the reasons that I love this trail the most because I feel like it, it really like, whether or not you know like all of the history that you just told, I think when you go to that space, you can feel that there is like really intense resonance. There is like resilience and vitality that like, you know, I walk there a lot now. And like, as I was saying before the call, like I've gotten to know like all the folks that are there all the time. And it's clear like how much people love that place. And really it's a, obviously an incredibly meaningful space to so many people. Um, Afak, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about the writing process of the story. I know there was a lot <laughs> going on for you. Um, so maybe talk about like some of the themes you were drawing on in terms of its creation and maybe also some of the other outside world uh, experiences and influences that were happening during its creation. Thank you. I actually remember the first time I went to the trail. It was like uh, my first impression, like it is for when I meet people or anything really, was a series of questions. And the first one was, what happened here? The second one, I think, was, what are you hiding? Because the trail just felt, something felt off. It felt strange because it looked so beautiful. And then I saw the fences. I saw past the fences. Um, noticed there was still like a lot of um, gunk and how it was locked away and then it put me in my feelings. I was already in my feelings because there's war going on. Um, simultaneously in Sudan, the revolution, um, the uprising, I'd say, was, I wouldn't say starting, but it was um, apparent again to everyone else that it was occurring um so at the time i was thinking about back home my mind was on sudan while i was here um the funny thing about philadelphia the reason i find it home even though i'm in the states and not really where i consider home um one of the reasons is because it's a city between two rivers and in Sudan, there's the White Nile and the Blue Nile. Um, there's a story that where they meet, um, they call it a kiss, where the two rivers meet. So being surrounded by water, um, even if the revolution wasn't going on, I would think about Sudan. Um, I'm an indigenous African, I'm the indigenous to Darfur. Um, I won't get into <laughs> the politics of Sudan, but I'll let you know that um, what happens to the indigenous people and what is currently happening to the indigenous people in the States is why I'm in the States, because that's what happened to me, my family, but still going on. So when I walked into the trail, um, I was thinking about what happened. 
Um, I saw the parallels between who, who the land, who thinks the land belongs to them, um, who was probably here. I remember when I first told Adrian about my story, thinking one of the first things I said was memories because um, I was still really focused on what happened. Um, so my writing process included thinking about a literal war. <laughs> um, I lost a family member to that uprising. And then, like I said, even before I started on this project, I was sick and I was in denial. So my symptoms were getting worse as I wrote more. Um, but yeah, so I would say there was a lot of pain involved, a lot of remembering, um, a lot of naming, a lot of water. And that's why I think it became what it was, which was, I would say, a, a not lighthearted tale. <laughs> it is what it is. <laughs> I'm interested um, if you, like, when you first heard the story, um, which I think was in my car because <laughs> we had just finished putting together the full version of it. Um, uh, and, and you hadn't heard it before. And I think, I, I think we actually like drove and like listened to the entire thing <laughs> together. Um, but I'm interested to know, like sort of knowing all of the, the things that were in your mind in, in terms of its creation, like how do you, when you, when you remember back to like hearing the story for the first time, what, I don't know, what was your first thought or experience sort of hearing it all translated into a final product? It was trippy. <laughs> um, and I don't just mean the, the strangeness of hearing your own voice or something that you created. I mean, I designed the story to be what I needed at the time, hoping it would be that for other people. So hearing it, long after I'd written it, long after I'd recorded it, um, not really understanding what the full picture looked like, um, I felt like I was coming at my own neck. I was just like, oh my god, leave me alone. <laughs> but at the same time, I remember sitting in that car and it did remind me um, what it took for this story to happen. Um, what I survived in the process before that, what was probably coming. Because um, again, I did I think at that point, I realized I was getting sicker. Um, but it was wild because it's something, I designed it to be a story that I hope you can't just walk away from. You can't just go like, oh, this was nice. Because um, that's what I felt about the trail at the time. I was like, I can't just enjoy the scenery and not wonder what happened. So hearing my story, um, it, it made me feel better. I don't know what I was going through, but I'm always going through it. Um, so it put me in a better place that day. Um, it reminded me how I got here and it propelled me to act although I hadn't decided what that action would look like. Um, but I remember it like, Adrian, you were there, you were driving. I was just like, what? <laughs> <laughs> the whole time. Um, it was a visceral. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it was maybe one of my, one of my favorite author reactions watching the Monster <laughs> story. Um. I'm interested, Justin, to hear you answer the same question, actually, because as somebody who knows that space so well um, and kind of got to hear this piece like after it had, had fully birthed, like knowing where it was intended to be placed, like if you had any uh, first reactions on hearing it. Yeah, I mean, I, I already kind of mentioned this uh, before we started today, but up front was just struck by the beauty of the prose, the pace, the diction, the syntax, your voice, everything came together in such a um, beautiful way that I was almost unable to actually focus on what was being said. I had to like work through that um, and, and listen a couple more times to like even get through the full scope of, of what you were trying to convey. And I think um, 
one of the awesome things about art, and I know that I'm not, you know, this isn't falling on deaf ears. I'm preaching to the choir in many ways, but I think it's especially true with music and anything that's that um, you can hear is is that it it's very easy to draw people back to places and times where um, they can recognize exactly what the person who wrote that piece was going through in that moment. And when I first heard it, I'm similarly going through this, um, this whole like adult brain growing up, you know, finally getting into my own of where I feel like I have control of my thoughts and emotions and have been um, working through a lot of like previously unresolved trauma that um, I'm now realizing for the first time, like was actually traumatic. <laughs> Um, and I know that when you, similar to what you were saying before, Afak, like, you know, how hard can you push and how how much can you be in denial? And that's sort of where I am, you know, right now to an extent, but um, have been really going through in the last year of like trying to, um, trying to find out like how to get out of the river almost, right? Like, I feel like a river kind of just takes you and I want to be out of it and like able to be in the ocean and just do my own thing. and not have something directing me that I'm not in control of. So it kind of tied all of the stuff I had been working through together with like a nice little bow of like, ah, holy cow, like that's it, that's it right there. Um, yeah, and, and you already sort of touched on, on this a little bit, but um, that word resilience is huge. And I think that, uh, you know, you, you say in the beginning, the wound is the place where the light enters you. And I think that that's such an incredible way of, of viewing um, things that we would otherwise sort of just cast aside as negative experiences. And I think that um, this park is a perfect example of um, exactly that, right? Of, of something that could have just been forgotten and left and another thing that someone didn't do right by the people who needed it at that time. Um, so yeah, this this speaks to to resilience for me, and I think now you know as we open the park, I just mentioned the history, but um, it's moving from wound to scar, right? In in terms of like where we're, we're we're getting to the point where we can try to forget and push away some of those things that um, are kind of holding us back. So for me personally, and I know I let a, lo a couple of other people listen um, that I knew wouldn't be able to get down to the property and do it with the geolocations. Um, we were all in a similar place of like just really in in disbelief of how perfectly it captured our own thinking um, and maybe something about where we're at in America right now has you know something to do with how we're all thinking about our own issues and our own futures but I know for me um, and I mentioned this before like each time I listen to it it resonates more and more deeply with me so um, I'll, yeah I, I can stop there but it's it's just perfect I have no other words it's perfect <laughs> And Adrian told me it was perfect. And I was like, oh, it's perfect. Of course she says it's perfect. She's in charge of it, but no, it's, it's perfect. <laughs> I do want to be like, I mean, I think it was one of the things, and we'll listen to another clip in a second, but I do think it's one of the things about the, and maybe it's like the fact that, that your form is poetry, um, that it's a piece that I know, like I've listened to it so many times and, and I'm, I'm, and when I'm on the trail, like, I feel like, there are the takers in a fox story like you know they are you talk about the abuse of the land and the people and those two things become one and the same and i feel like you know as i'm walking like i know the background about the revolution because you told me that but i also know like some of the history of the site because justin has told me that like and i'm also there sort of like literally on the site like you know in this you know it's like on one on the left side as you're walking you have this incredibly beautiful vista of these trees and the river and then on the other side you know you have like houses and developments and gas stations and it's like just you're constantly literally at the center of this dissonance between these two spaces of like what is possible and 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 sort of what 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 is or what is happening on the other side um I wonder, Katie, if we can listen to that second uh, clip really quick. Yep, here it comes. Nichols, this land was once water. In the water, there were no borders, no end and no stillness, no roots, 
No limits, no loss. When they came, they drew lines and called everything theirs, even the water. It was this misnaming that turned the world upside down. You can see it in the stone, how they took the rocks from the belly of the river and built their homes with them as if this land was not home to some already, as if all the life before them was just one more thing to bury, to take from or toss into a river. If you ignore what's been built around you, you'll see that this land is still alive. If you listen closely, every wound in the world says, Ya Ghalbi, Ya Ghalbi, O oh heart, my heart. Vibing on that music, <laughs> walking on the trail. <laughs> um, I'm interested, uh, and and either of you can jump in on this. Um, you know, I think this piece, as many of the pieces in Trail Off do, really has both an environmental justice and a, a social justice component that are like, it, it's not just like they're layered on top of each other. Like they are the same thing, right? Like they're 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 it's like a cookie, right? You can't take the egg out of the cookie. It's like <laughs> they are like fundamentally baked together in a way. Um, and I'm just interested to know like how you think that um, having those two things like in the same space at the same time um, either speaks differently to either of those two things or maybe works in a way that like traditional activism that just focuses on one of those components. Um, how that might be different, if that makes sense. Well, I can say a little bit about that. Um, I hope I'm answering this question right. But as, like I said, I'm an indigenous African. Some people go, like, oh, aren't all Africans indigenous? No, <laughs> I'm, I'm an indigenous African in the sense that indigenous people um, here are, it's different. Um, and because of that, environmental justice is social justice because um, what happens to the land, um, it hits the most vulnerable people first. And that's what my family historically is. And I am um, like just my body itself due to pollution and um, <laughs> what's happening in the world has literally impacted me by myself. Um, in Sudan, one of the reasons that the, the river was so important to me and why that last clip literally hit home, because I wrote it, but hit home very hard, um, was they weren't just um, killing people during the uprising. They were literally throwing their bodies into the water so that people couldn't drink it. Those two things were linked. Um, what happens to the river happens to the people. Um, <laughs> totally. <Yes. laughs> um, Justin, do you have any anything to add in there? Yeah, I mean, I don't know how much um, there is no social justice without environmental justice, right? And that's the lens that we take it through. And um, you know, we're a land trust, right? So we protect land and New Jersey's resources for people and animals to be able to have and and remain healthy. So. Um, within our mission, right, we say for the benefit of all. Um, that's the last couple of words of our mission, and that comes to life through this type of stuff. And I, you know, we're not the first to do it, and we won't be the last, but um, being able to contribute at all, I hope, uh, sort of separates us a little bit from the takers. And, and that's really what my mind is kind of harkening back to is like, how, how do I personally, as a white presenting cis male, right, how do I not be a taker despite that my whole entire half of my existence is solely from taking, right? Um, and how am I able to give back in a way that 
doesn't perpetuate systems of exploitation and that doesn't put um, you know vulnerable communities that have been pushed systematically into those conditions in a place where I'm actively contributing and worsening the conditions that that they're living within so um, that that plagues our planet right and I think in the last couple of months we've like I hope have had some kind of awakening to that um, that we all can make a difference and have some impact but um, that's that's sort of where I'm at is like how do how do we take this and all just not be not be takers yeah feel that <laughs> um, I wonder uh, I'm, I might open it up for audience questions. So if, if folks want to start putting stuff in the chat, I'll look at the chat and pop it back to these two. Um, but I wonder if there's, I don't know exactly how to ask this, like insider, like it's, it's not exactly like the director's cut of <laughs> the way Sam wants for water, but maybe things that on your first listen or your first visit to the trail, um, either references in the language or the music um, or things actually at the site that people might not, notice on first glance like the first thing that popped to me um and maybe if you can speak to the color um which folks can't see just yet but when you download the app um each of the stories has a color code and we sort of um we generally asked uh the authors to kind of like give us some light feedback and a, and a fox had very strong feedback about what color it was gonna be <laughs> Um, but but uh, so maybe you start there and then I would love just like any other things that folks can sort of like keep a special eye out for. Well, um, as I've said, like probably a zillion times now, <laughs> I was thinking about Sudan while here. And also, of course, thinking about the desert. Um, that's why it's the way sand wants for water because of those two countries. I remember uh, literally from the first time I visited the trail, there was this one portion, I think it's past where the trail narrows into a place a car should not get to. Um. <laughs> not, not that anybody drove anybody down the trail for accessibility reasons. I definitely did not have. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a place that opens up. I know there's a gate that locks it up. And then you see sand. Then you see green stuff. They look called plants. I know that now. And then water. And then I remember standing on the sand, looking at the water. It really messed with my head, but it felt like I just want people to take a moment to stand there if it's possible. And through throughout the trail, you can do the whole trail without ever venturing into the wilderness. But I really urge people to look for secret places because it doesn't just like mess with your head. Sometimes what a body needs is to stare into space. And we didn't come all the way out there just to, you know, stick to the path. You know, that's the point, but eh, is it? <laughs> anyway, I urge people to look for pockets um, that are hidden from the trail and just see what comes to your heart, brain. <laughs> Yeah, there's definitely like, there's also this, um, I'll, as, a, as a person who spends a lot of time thinking about sound, there's an amazing thing that happens when you walk from the path towards the water, like, and it is the trippiest sound thing in the world where you go from the noise of Admiral Wilson Boulevard, and then there's just this moment where all of a sudden you go like, oh, the cars are gone, and the sound is different, and it's, it's, um, it's almost like you sort of like leave the human world behind. Yeah, I, I was going to um, talk about some of those pockets too, um, but I don't know that I need to, but would just say, get off the trail. Um, it's called trail off, right? Uh, let's, let's play on that one a little bit, but um, yeah, the gradient of sound as you move away from the roadway. Um, I mean, it's even crazy. I, you know, obviously the park is closed after um, dusk, you know, we have to do that for safety reasons within the city. Yeah, I authorize people are allowed to be there. So in this circumstance, it's okay. Um, but yeah, even at night, you know, it's, it's, it's so silent. And the further you get away, um, the more you hear frogs and different types of night birds and different types of bugs. Um, I guess one interesting thing that maybe people wouldn't uh, typically think about 
Um, and this is not within Gateway Park proper, but once you cross over Kane Avenue at the end of um, the trail within the park, um, you know, you move from Gateway towards Cooper River Lake, which is the other side of uh, Route 30 or Route 130. I always get confused which one's which there. Um, so you have to cross a four or five lane, maybe six lane highway um, with a super short stoplight. It's completely, you know, inaccessible to most people. Um, and, you know, so that's one barrier, right? And then, so that's the, the people barrier is right there. Um, Camden is not a, a, does not have a very strong car ownership. So having that roadway there, I, you know, we can get into the, into the details of bisecting urban communities with highways. That's a whole entire other study of transportation in itself. But if you turn away from that and look at the river, there's a dam there. And the dam doesn't allow passage of boating. Um, it was created to, it was built to create a lake at Cooper River Park which allowed suburban communities to have a place to recreate safely, a place that could attract um, various types of activities that are good for the economic status of those communities. Um, it's, it makes sense. The dam was put there for a reason. So that's just one thing I would say is that, you know, if you, if you don't pay attention to those types of things, uh, just think about the infrastructure and this is across the board for any kind of waterway of like why was this put here right the why finding the why what's the history of the place and and think about who that decision was made by and who that decision impacts and um, from there the story sort of unravels on its own i have to add one more thing yeah do it it's all beautiful um dragon nostrils if you see them Give no context. Just hit me up on social media. Let me know you saw the dragon nostrils. I feel like that, that's, that's like trail off deep cut. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if, uh, if anybody who's on the call wants to ask a question, you can jump in here. I have a few more um, so you don't have to feel pressure. But uh, if you guys want to, uh, these folks are here. Um, I know I'm interested. Oh, also, I wore your blue. Uh, a fock for the thing. <laughs> um, uh, I, I'm interested to know. Um, I, this is, I'm, I'm not exactly sure how to ask that, but I, like, is there something that you hope people take away from the experience of walking the story and the trail? Um, maybe it's not just one thing, but uh, like, what what do you hope that when people leave, they're thinking, feeling, experiencing? pondering oh so many things um i think the i really want people to have similar to the experience i had i want people to ask a lot of questions and don't let them disappear on the trail take them back home with you um like i said i was in extreme denial which is why my story is the way it is i designed the story um I think we were talking about this last time we were there, so it could not be an escape. I, I did not promote escapism, although it, it might be something where you can find a pocket of joy away. I want um, people to leave being a little less delusional, whatever delusions we're carrying. I hope that um, we confront ourselves when we're there not just me confronting everyone, including myself. <laughs> um, and I hope um, more than answers, I hope people walk away with questions. And I hope everybody who leaves the trail um, decides to do at least one thing, whether it's for them or the world, preferably the world. Um, I just hope that something comes of this. That's awesome. Uh, Justin, you have anything you want to add before we wrap up? Um, yeah, I, you know, I'll just go back to what I said. I was so lost in the beauty of it that I needed to listen again. And I know I have the inside scoop of like having the raw, you know, uncut version. It's the full length. Um, but 
it took more than one listen through to really get to the point that you were just hoping for. And I, I don't mean that in the sense of it wasn't effective. I mean that in the sense of the first time I listened through, I didn't even have the ability to reference myself in space because I had to reference myself in my person, right? So that's what I would say is just like, keep listening, <laughs> keep listening, keep listening. It's beautiful and it never gets old. Well, luckily, the end of the story ends with return, return until you do. <laughs> As the, the, I mean, I, I, uh, you guys will just have to go do it in the actual trail to know what I'm talking about. Um, but, but the final invocation of the story really is, um, which, I, which I think in some ways is like the project of the trail off piece at its core, right? It isn't just a, it is narrative, but it's also about creating deeper connections to the spaces that we're in. Um, Wow, I knew this conversation was gonna be awesome. <laughs> um, Afag and Justin, thank you so, so much. Um, it was just a real treat um, to get to talk with you. And, and I, I um, just hope that everybody on this call and listening to this afterwards on the Fringe website, um, definitely like download the Trail Off app, go to the website, www.trailoff.com, um, visit the Cooper River Trail and listen to a fox story the way sand wants for water, you will be so happy you did. <laughs> um, and check out all the rest of our trail off stories. Um, yeah, uh, unless Katie, you have anything else that you want to say, um, I think that's it for this.